Everyone loves a good story and a good storyteller. But there is no storyteller like the Lord Jesus, and there are no greater stories told than the ones Jesus shared. In this study, Spiritual Stories, we consider the parables Jesus told and their application to us. These are truly the greatest stories ever told, and the Lord has something He wants to say to you through them. Let's join Scott Pauley now. Many years ago, I heard a man say that there's no hurt like family hurt. Finances, physical, none of that compares uh, to the, the brokenness of a person's heart when their home is broken in some way. And I believe that's exactly right. Well, imagine the broken heart of the Heavenly Father uh, when so many that He has created and loved and given His Son for reject Him and run the other direction. Today we return to Luke chapter 15 to Jesus' story of the lost. Remember, we've had the lost sheep, we've had the lost coin, and now we come really to the climactic section of this chapter. Uh, this is the lost son. In fact, I'm going to show you before we're done, it's lost sons. There are two of them, a younger brother and an older brother. But this is the, the greatest, uh, I think, picture of what it means to be lost and also the greatest picture of the loving heart of our God. Charles Dickens and Shakespeare both referred to this story as the greatest short story in history. Uh, Rembrandt painted not one but two paintings of what is commonly referred to as the prodigal son. And full disclosure, before we begin to read our text today in Luke 15, uh, this is my favorite Bible story. If you had to just pinpoint one and say, what's your favorite? It's this one because it always brings me back to who God is it warms my heart. Luke 15 verse 11 says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants. I have to tell you that his request at the beginning, his request at the end were very different. He started saying, give me, and he ended saying, make me. Uh, that's a different young man. That's a changed heart. We'll pause here for a moment and read the rest of the story, the, the great conclusion in just a second. But uh, we're looking at one that is lost in the far country. The lost son, but this particular son has has run far away from God. That's really what sin is. It's running from God. Everybody's either running toward the Lord or away from the Lord. And this young man's a picture of those who, like Adam and Eve, hiding in the garden uh, way back in Genesis, is running away from God. So what's the great interpretation of this part of the parable? Well, it's this, that sin brings you to nothing, and the Father brings you to everything. There's a great contrast in the story between the effects of sin and uh, the beautiful resources and riches that the Father gives. Don't miss that. For example, listen again to, to some of the elements in the opening part of this story. Uh, this young man says, give me my inheritance now. What he wanted was the Father's gifts, but not the Father. There's a whole lot of people in this world who want God's blessings without God. He literally was saying to his father, I don't want to wait till you die to get the inheritance. I'd rather have the money now. I wonder, are we trying to use God for what we can get out of him, or do we really want God? And then the Bible says that he took his journey into a far country. And I want to tell you, the far country is always further than you think it is. 
And uh, when you get there, it's not all it's cracked up to be. The Bible says he wasted his substance with riotous living. Every man's life is either wasted or it is invested. But either way, it's going to be spent. And when it's spent, you do not get it back. The Bible says when he'd spent all, a famine came. Thank God for the famine. Maybe God's sending a famine your way to bring you to nothing today. That's the Lord's mercy to stop you in your tracks, to bring you to the end of yourself so he can bring you to God. The Bible says that he started feeding swine. That was a shame for a Jewish boy. Unclean things. That's a picture of sin in itself. It's uncleanness. And look at the emptiness. He's so hungry with nothing to eat, nobody giving to him, nobody helping him. By the way, nobody can do for you what only Jesus can do for you. But he starts eating the husk that the swine had already eaten the kernel out of. Think about that just a minute, how desperate sin brings a man to. And there comes a moment when the Bible says he came to himself. I love that. Before you can come to God, you've got to come to yourself. You come to a moment where you realize you're a sinner, you can't fix this, and nobody else can help you. Friend, that's a very good place to get to. Because when you get to wit's end, you're on the verge of the spiritual breakthrough. And it's at that moment that the Bible says in verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, could I point out he didn't let him finish his prayer. God doesn't forgive you because you pray a good prayer. And the part of the prayer he didn't let him pray was make me as one of thy hired servants. Look, God doesn't have any hired servants. He has sons. You don't serve him to get something. God is pictured here as being so merciful, he just interrupts. He just jumps right in the middle of it and says, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I say again, sin brings you to nothing. The father brings you to everything. There is acceptance here. There is access here. There is abundance here. Look at his ring. Look at his shoes. Look at the feast on the table. Look, sin is a dead end. God gives an open door. Sin closes in on a man. The Lord opens up every good thing God has for us. That's the interpretation of this parable. So what's the revelation? Well, the revelation, I believe, could be described in this one word, the compassion of God. The Bible says that he had compassion. This old man runs to his son, throws his arms around him, protecting him from anybody else, getting him as they would have in that day and stoning that runaway boy. He's saying, put your hands off of him. This one belongs to me. Oh, this is wonderful. Friend, your God is not just rich in resources. He's rich in love. The old Puritans called this story not the parable of the prodigal son. They would call it the parable of the wonderful father. I love that because the story is really not about the sinner. It's about the Savior. You see, there's actually another son in the story. It's not the prodigal son, and it's not the elder son who stayed home. It's the son of God who's telling the story, who came so that we could be forgiven and accepted. What a picture of our great God, patiently waiting, watching, and then happily running and embracing this is the Lord's salvation of lost people. So if we have the interpretation right and we, we're beginning to understand the revelation, what's the application? Well, if you're a sinner, I would say this, stop practicing your prayer and just come home. Stop thinking about all the bad things you've ever done and trying to figure out how you can convince the Father to forgive you. Just come to him. He's more ready to forgive than you are uh, to, to even come. He's waiting on you at this moment. Just run to him and you'll find him running towards you. And if you've been saved, why don't you pause today and just meditate on how wonderful salvation is and rejoice that he didn't stop you on the porch. He brought you right back into the house, that the lost has been found. I love the fact this tragic story ends with this glad note. They began to be merry. Friend, enjoy the salvation Jesus purchased and God gave today. That which is lost has now been found. The parables of the Lord Jesus Christ hold tremendous truth and application to us today. And to help you in this study, we encourage you to visit our website, enjoyingthejourney.org, where Scott has prepared a reading guide to the parables that you can download and use. On our website, you will find many helpful tools and resources to help you in your walk with the Lord. 
Every sermon, each study, all of our resources are for the purpose of following God's Word and finding Christ's joy.